Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Crime Country. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest who is going to walk us through a series of murders that would shock the world, launch one of the largest manhunts in human history, but in the end has become forgotten in regular public circles that generally enjoy true crime. And so, we are joined today by none other than Robin Jirasi. Robin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Nick. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, joining you, reviewing this uh, really shocking and uh, sadly forgotten case, but uh, it's very interesting. For those who may not be familiar with your work, would you walk us through a little bit about you and tell our audience about yourself today? Sure. Yeah, I'm a journalist and I was working on a national newspaper here. Um, I was looking for some ideas to uh, write about for a, a true crime magazine that the Daily Mirror were going to um, launch. Um, and so I suggested it would be good to try and write about some cases which perhaps people hadn't heard of so much. And um, I did a Google search and I came across a case which I was astonished that I'd never heard of this case. Now, this was a series of murders that happened in the 1960s in London. Whoever it was who committed these crimes killed more women than Jack the Ripper. And yet the crimes were completely forgotten. Maybe a few people had heard of them, but not many. It struck me as incredibly sad that the uh, victims had been forgotten. The killer had got away with it. And I was curious as to why this had happened, and I was really interested to know more. I live in London, so it seemed extraordinary to me that in this city, this had happened within living memory, and um, it had been largely faded now. So that's how I, my interest in the case came about, and I started to research it, and uh, eventually it became a book. Before we approach the killings and the oftentimes marginalized victims, I want to talk a little bit about the local society that these killings, the victims, and the killer would have operated in. What do we know about the local society during this time, and did it provide an environment for these murders? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question because um, I was actually living in London as a child um, during the 60s, so I do have memories of it. And um, London was an interesting place then. It was still pockmarked by bomb sites from the war. Um, throughout the 1950s, the country basically was still getting to its feet. Um, it was in debt. There'd been rationing. The city was still being rebuilt. There was some homelessness. And so by the, by the 60s, this begins to change. And I think there's a certain confidence coming back into the culture. And, you know, we have Time magazine calling London the swinging city. There's this whole explosion of interesting things going on with fashion and photography and music. But at the same time, there's an underbelly to London. There was a, a thriving sex trade. Um, street walking was becoming less common because curb crawling was, was taking over. And um, as the police discovered while they were investigating this case, there was a, been an explosion in curb crawling. And so... The case touched on one or two other scandals that had gone in British uh, society during the early 60s as well. So it's an interesting juxtaposition between this incredible, vibrant cultural scene and this underbelly at the same time of things going on on the streets, a lot of deprivation. One or two areas such as Notting Hill, which is central to where these crimes occurred um, today are luxury areas, but back then were slums. I mean, literally with rats in the street. So, um, you know, there's a lot of inter interesting contrasts going on in society. And, and yeah, that is the backdrop to what's going on with these crimes. When you hear the term, the Hammersmith nude murders, what comes to your mind based on your research and even your imagination? What comes to my mind, I think, is, is a sort of an investigation that still taunts us from history. Uh, it, it, there, it was a... A terribly sad case. Um, six women certainly were, were murdered. The police threw everything they could at this. Um, it happened on the streets of London. You know, the bodies were found in, in broad daylight. And yet the killer is still in the shadows. 
it's it's it, it, you know it's so infuriating because so much hard work went into catching this guy. Um, I mean, the police just could not have done any anything more, really, but they just could not crack the case. And so it's one of those cases which is just frustrating, but fascinating, but taunting as well. You just feel like somebody got away with this and lived the rest of their life, and um, there was no justice. When it comes to the press and their typical reporting on serial murder, especially in the popular imagination, why did they choose the nickname Jack the Stripper? Yes, I think the, um, the, the British tabloids, like American tabloids, can't resist a cheesy pun, really. And, um, you know, Jack the Stripper was just a, a way that they could jump on and mention Jack, Jack the Ripper. You know, there were certain parallels to the similar number of victims, both in London, although different parts of London. Jack the Ripper was in East London. Um, these these crimes were in West London. Um, and of course, it's just a, it's just a pun. But it, I think it also goes to show the lack of empathy, really, that um, there was in, in the media towards the victims. I spent a lot of time in the British Library reading the newspapers of, of the time and all the coverage of the cases. And there's very little empathy or sympathy or concern expressed for the families of the women who were murdered. You know, they were daughters, sisters, wives, mothers, um, and yet they were never talked of in terms of, of the fact that they'd had their lives taken away from them. Um, the coverage was always fascinated by the, you know, the sex trade, and there was a certain prurientness the way, in the way it was presented but very little about the human aspect of it. These were people who'd lost their lives and um, they, they had left motherless children behind, um, had left partners and husbands roaming the streets looking for them. So unfortunately, the Jack the Stripper label shows a kind of callousness towards their plights, really. And before really diving into the case, I want to do something that I feel more investigators should do, especially when producing content of this nature. And I want to actually talk about the victims. What do we know about them? What did they have in common? What were their differences? That they were all of the type. It's clear that the perpetrator of these murders was looking for a certain type of, of uh, victim. They all had troubled backgrounds. None of them came from London. They all came from outside London. I think a couple came from Scotland. One came from Dublin, some came from, I think one came from Newcastle. They came from various communities outside of London. They came to London looking for some way to kind of make a living, escape perhaps some sort of horrible work. I think one was working on a farm. We, I mean, we don't know too much about their reasons for coming to London, but they were certainly coming to London to sort of have a better life, earn a decent living. But for one reason or another, they, they ended up doing sex work. One or two of them already had convictions before they got to London. So basically, they, they were not very well educated. They didn't have any prospects. And so they eventually found themselves doing this, this dreadful sort of work on the streets of London. Physically, they were all petite. They were, I think the tallest was five foot two, five foot three. Um, so the killer was always looking for diminutive women, the assumption being that they were easy for him to overpower. The other assumption might be that they were childlike to him. Um, and we'll come back to that. <laughs> Most of them had sort of convictions for one or two things, such as theft, soliciting, and, and that kind of thing. They had children, most of them, and they basically led very hard lives on the streets of London. Um, they they would probably take amphetamines or drink, stay in the pubs until closing time, and then go to work. So it was a hard grinding job where you were being driven to remote places, but having been picked up on the street, and would then have to find your way back to your beat. And and they encountered violence, disease, neglect, uh, and usually had pretty rocky private lives as well. So. Um, that, I think, is what they all had in common, really. And when it comes to the murders, these tragic, 
circumstances and events that were viciously inflicted on these women who were really, they had came to London to escape something. And in the end, they went to the wrong place. And so my question is, when did the murders happen and how did they unfold? Yeah, that, that's an inter- interesting question because um, the police decided in the end that there were six victims. Um, but there were two cases that occurred earlier than that. And for a while, it was thought that there may have been eight victims, but the first two are generally discounted now. There was a woman called um, Elizabeth Fig, who was discovered by the banks of the Thames in 1959. She'd been strangled and had been found sitting under a tree uh, in a remote spot by the river. And then there was an the body of another woman found on a, on a rubbish, municipal rubbish dump in 1963. That was uh, Gwyneth Rees. Um, now, those two are generally discounted for various reasons. They, the MO was different. It, it was diff- difficult to actually tell how Gwyneth Rees had actually died. Um, so the case, the case load really begins in 1964 when two bodies were found uh, in sequence in the, in the Thames. So the killer initially started by depositing his bodies in the Thames. He then, um, and that was, um, that would have been Hannah Tailford and Irene Lockwood were the first two. Um, and then the remaining four were discovered in the street in West London. And that came to a conclusion in January 1965 was the last murder. And that was Bridie O'Hara, who was found on a trading estate in West London. Um, so it looks as though the killer started in 64. He favoured the river as a way of, of depositing uh, his bodies um, and then decided for some reason to leave them in the street. Um, and the way it is approach to this was to always remove the clothing and any jewelry, handbags, even the teeth. So if they had false teeth, he would remove their teeth as well. Um, the problem this created, of course, was forensically, it was very difficult for the police because um, there was no fibers, fingerprints. It was very difficult. So um, the killer obviously looks incredibly forensically aware um, and so the other interesting thing about what he was doing was he was picking them up and keeping them for a while. So um, when we come to um, Helen Bartholomew, who was left in the street in West London, she was the first victim not found in water, and it gave the police their very first clue. So um, it was discovered that she had various bits of dust and specks of paint, probably from a, a spray gun. So um, that was the only thing that they could find. And that was the only bit of forensic evidence found throughout the whole case, um, that the bodies that were then found in the streets all had that on them. So it was clear that the killer was picking his victims up, murdering them, and then keeping them somewhere where they were gathering this dust and and paint specks and then leaving them in the street. So he was incredibly methodical and had a whole system worked out. As we know, these murders are going to launch one of the largest manhunts in human history. Yeah. The world was in awe. And so my question is, all of that manpower, all of those resources, and it fails. Yeah. Why is that? Um, That's a very big question. It is very interesting. Um, You would... You would think that the biggest investigation with the most officers, uh, there was something like 600 officers involved in this case, um, you would think that with all that thrown at it, um, how could it fail? But there were reasons for it failing, I think, which are clearer with hindsight probably than they were at the time. Once it became clear that there was a serial killer, not that they were called serial killers in the 60s, but once they were, it became clear that there was somebody methodically killing people, Scotland Yard then actually threw everything it had at at this case, Um, and it it snowballed as well. By the time um, John DeRose, who was the most senior investigative um, officer, was was drafted in, 
which was later on in 1964, uh, the case had already, it was already effectively four murder investigations, five murder investigations, all, all on top of each other. Um, and by the time he came along, he re then requested further resources. So um, in London, which is a big city, but Scotland Yard threw hundreds of detectives at this, hundreds of officers on the street. They, they used the river police. They used dog handlers. They had female officers dressed as street walkers on the streets um, in the red light areas, approaching cars to try and get any information they could about slightly suspects, anyone who, who stood out. Um, and the female officers then had to also have a male officer hiding in a doorway in case anyone tried to abduct them, which did actually happen a few times. On top of that, they had special um, vantage points set up on the main routes into West London, which was roughly 22 miles square um, of officers sitting there all night just writing down uh, license plate numbers. And then if cars were seen several times, the police would then have to look up, not on a computer, <laughs> but go to County Hall the next day where there were vast, you know, corridors of, of files with all the car registrations, find out who the owners were, and then go and visit them and say, would you mind if we asked what you were doing uh, driving around that time of night? On top of that, they, uh, John DeRose then asked for the special patrol group, which was a new unit of police that was set up in late 64, which was another couple of hundred officers to be drafted in. They had policemen hanging around clubs and bars in the West End to try and to literally just pick up any bits of gen that they could on anyone who'd heard anything, any tittle-tattle. And so this was a huge effort of manpower thrown at, at the case. And the approach at that in those days, at that time, and with, with this case, and this, this phrase is actually used by one of the detectives, we've left no stone unturned. Now, a modern investigation does not go for that kind of no stone unturned approach. Um, the modern way of doing it would be to try and focus the investigation a lot more rather than trying to, I mean, in a way, it was a bit of a hit and hope because they had no strong suspects and no forensic evidence. And this killer was so expert at picking up his victims without anyone noticing, they had no strong leads. So they were basically hitting, and just swinging at it and hoping to hit the ball. Um, they were hoping that something would turn up. They interviewed thousands of people. They interviewed hundreds and hundreds of motorists. Um, and they just were unlucky in the end. Um, but whether they missed any connections, because I mean, it was such a huge investigation, uh, whether they missed any connections or they failed to pick up on one or two obvious suspects is a, is a possibility. Interestingly, I mean, the Yorkshire Ripper case, which was around 15 years later, had exactly the same problem. They were under an avalanche of information and important connections were missed. Again, this was pre-computers and Interestingly, the way investigations were structured in the 1960s in this country, you would have a head man who was, in this case, John Rose, and he had his deputy who was Bill Baldock. And they were, they were managing all the um, investigations under them. Now, I think when you've got perhaps one murder investigation and most murders involve people who know each other, that you know, that structure might work okay. But when you've got this vast data information gathering across several different crimes, having that kind of pyramid structure is, is perhaps not so clever. Um, today, um, it's much more collegiate. The actions of the people at the top are reviewed all the time so that if, if the investigation does take a long turn, they're under review and people, senior people will say, you've got to um, perhaps go back and take another avenue. But at the time, it was all under John DeRose and um, yeah, they just missed it. And so we have this massive manhunt, thousands of interviews, work in compiling data that I can't possibly imagine. Did it ever produce 
any suspects? Were there any original suspects at all? Yes, um, the police, probably the best um, suspect that they came up with early on <laughs> was one of their own. Um, it was a, a detective based in West London. Now, one of the one thing that was clear about whoever the killer was is that he knew the byways and back alleys of, of London really well because he was leaving the victims in cul-de-sacs and in out-of-the-way places that were good to drive to without being spotted during the night. So this guy knew certainly knew West London. Um, now, the detective that uh, eventually came under suspicion had worked all over West London. Um, and he was an interesting character because he was a, a guy who was not popular with his colleagues. And um, he seems to have developed some kind of animus towards the police um, because he was a bit of a fish out of water. Didn't get on with anyone. No one liked him. And so he decided, bizarrely, to start committing burglaries in West London in a bid to perhaps generate work for his colleagues as a kind of, you know, take this. Now, the things he was stealing were just ridiculous, you know, rubbish, like tools and from warehouses and, and things. But he was creating, you know, uh, burglary reports and they were investigating them. <laughs> But he wasn't very good at it. And so he was committing these crimes on his motorbike and was eventually spotted riding away, caught very easily. That finished his career and he ended up doing a year in jail. But the senior officers in charge of this case suddenly thought, well, maybe he was also committing murders to, um, you know, get one back on the police. Um, and so they spent many months investigating him once he'd, once he'd come out. Um, but they traced his movements, what he'd been doing, where he'd been working. He, he ended up as a, as a car salesman after that. They traced him all over the place. They traced him to where he lived, to his routes into town. Um, and after many, many man hours of work and interviewing his, his employers and, and everyone that knew him, there was not one shred of evidence that he ever came into contact with any of the victims, uh, and certainly no um, forensic links between him and the victims either. So although they were very keen that he looked very promising, it all came to nothing. So he was their most promising one early on, and they spent a lot of time um, looking into him. But in the end, they just had to drop it. Apart from that, he was, he was probably the strongest person that they uh, latched onto. Everyone else was things like people reporting strange things that the neighbours were doing or violence or um, one or two um, sex workers reported that they'd been attacked and so the police would investigate what happened. Well, one or two people that were seen cruising a lot in certain areas and perhaps were threatening towards women. I mean, once or twice there were uh, one or two hunters threatened to kill prostitutes and uh, started to asphyxiate them, which was this, this killer's uh, method, um, but then pulled, they, they then stopped and the police investigated them, but there were never any really strong suspects. Um, there are urban myths about one or two people, such as the champion boxer in Britain called Freddie Mills. After his um, boxing career, he became a, a celebrity on TV and a very popular figure who um, seems to have committed suicide. And very early on in this, uh, the, the idea it was a rumour, basically, that started to go around that perhaps he would killed himself because he had these crimes on his conscience. But there's no evidence to suggest that. He never featured in the investigations. So that also came to nothing, really. And that was about it, really, in terms of really strong suspects. So it was uh, they chased a lot of people down. They looked into a lot of reports, but it all came to nothing. And now you have this investigation. And it's no secret that across the world, some of these especially large investigations occasionally come with scandals. And my question is, were there any scandals that took place relating to the investigation? 
the main newspapers in this country were largely supportive of um, the police efforts at the time and, and, and reported them faithfully and loyally uh, about um, all the effort that they were putting into the case and uh, well, basically on, on the side of Scotland Yard. Um, there were, I mean, but a few years afterwards, then that, that was when there, any, any cracks in the investigation began to appear in the media. Um, and so in 1972, a story appeared in, in The Sun in, in London, um, which looked back on the case a bit, and it, it betrayed the fact that it all was not harmonious in the investigation. Um, and now The Sun reported um, a story which was that it was very possible. It went back to the idea that it was a policeman that had done this because the uh, perpetrator had been forensically clever, had evaded the investigation. Perhaps he knew what they were doing, where they were looking, and was able to you know, evade, evade detection that way. And um, the police obviously would know the area as well. So um, this report said that that was possibly um, what was going on. Now, that was basically a counterattack on um, John DeRose's autobiography, now, what had happened was that after he retired, um, later on in the 60s, John DeRose wrote uh, an account of his career, and, and he had a lot of big successes as, as Scotland Yard's leading detective. He was called Four Day Johnny because he closed cases so quickly. But with this case, the Hammersmith nude murders, he'd failed spectacularly. He'd never found the killer, and he had the biggest amount of resources ever given to any detective, and he'd failed. But what he said in his book was, he actually knew who the killer was all the time. And he came up with the idea, well, he put forward the idea that they um, were investigating a man who was a security guard in, um, on a trading estate in West London. This guy's name was Mungo Island. And in the book, he put forward the idea that because of the pressure that the police were, were closing in on this guy and, and Mungo Island knew this, um, Mungo Island had ended up killing himself. Now, Mungo Island was a rather sad character who worked as a security guard. He was a bit of a drinker. His life was basically, you know, he was really unhappy. And he did kill himself. And he left a note that I, he couldn't carry on or something. Now, he never confessed the, the crimes at all. And I've actually seen the Scotland Yard report that was produced by... John DeRose's um, right-hand man, uh, which was a summary of the whole investigation. And Mungo Island barely is mentioned in this. So the idea that uh, John DeRose put forward later on, that actually I knew who it was all the time, um, is really making it up after the event. Mungo Island was looked at very briefly months later in the investigation, um, after the killing stopped. And he, he came to the, the attention of detectives because he committed suicide and he worked on the estate. But again, there was no evidence to connect him and the police never really took him very seriously. And on top of that, he was, he was back in Scotland where he came from um, on the night of one of the murders anyway. It was feasible that he could have raced down to London, committed a murder and then raced back again, but it was so unlikely. So it looks as though this was John DeRose um, basically bigging himself up, you know, um, although it looks as though I didn't catch the killer, I knew who it was all along. Um, but what uh, seems to have happened by 1972 was that it looks as though Bill Baldock may have actually spoke to the son and said that was all claptrap. In fact, it's more likely that it was a policeman that committed this. So it looks like there was a bit of um, various people getting their uh, <laughs> revisions of history into the press at that time. And as we go decades later to the present, in your opinion, why has this vicious series of events that caused one of the largest manhunts in history, why has it faded away from the minds of the general public? I think we come back to the fact that there wasn't much uh, sympathy back at that time with the victims. Um, when the last uh, murder occurred in, 19, in January 1965, um, once the police had this, uh, um, could see that there were no more crimes were going to be committed, the 
investigation was run down very quickly. Now, it had been a real strain on the Metropolitan Police in Scotland Yard. I mean, it had sucked resources out of everything else. So it is understandable that they wanted to kind of get people back to their normal jobs. Um, but it, it did kind of suck the life out of the investigation and all efforts really fizzled out. And although the case remained open, there was no political pressure, there was no public pressure to say what's going on, why, why is nothing moving forward with this case? Um, I suspect that had, um, had the victims been nurses or housewives or other members of society, um, the outrage would have been a lot, lot more severe. Um, and we, we see this a bit with the Yorkshire Ripper case again. Early on in, in the uh, series of murders, uh, the police talked about him attacking prostitutes and that the victims were prostitutes. But when a student was attacked, it then created this, this feeling that now he's attacking people like us. And the pressure on the police increased a lot. So and that included the police saying that themselves, that um, this was an attack on you know, mainstream society. So we need to do something about this. Whereas I think it was too easy to sideline the victims in the 60s. They were, they were taking a terrible risk. They were leading unsavory lives. Um, you know, that's what happens if you live that kind of life, I think, was the attitude. Um, so it was very easy for them to be forgotten once the, um, the, the investigation was run down. And now, as we approach the present, modern day technology, modern forensics, new methodology, in how investigations take place. What do modern day experts have to say about these past cases? That's interesting. I, I think um, one of the things which I, I found fascinating by talking to modern experts about this, including a chap called um, Kim Rosmo, who's a, a leading geographic profiler based in Texas. Um, he, he's developed an algorithm which, which is used in geographic profiling, which is a common tool now for, for the police. Now, geographic profiling doesn't solve the case and it doesn't um, pinpoint who the killer is. But what it does do is it helps the police to focus on a small area. Um, whereas this, in the 60s, the police in London were, were, were trying to cover 22 square miles, even with hundreds of officers and trying to canvas all the shops and, and residents. They just, it was impossible. It was too, but you were looking for a, a needle in a giant haystack. So geographic profiling helps to kind of bring it down to a couple of miles. Um, and then the police can really seriously take a very close look at who lives there and what, and, and what kind of possibilities there are there for, for suspects. And happily for me, um, Kim Rossmo did a uh, geographic profile for these cases based on information that I gave him. And um, he, he zeroed in, he came up with some hot spots, is what they call this. There's two hot spots basically that he, he focused on. He he's um, provided me with the data which shows that there's a strong possibility that the killer was based either in Hammersmith, which is the, the most likely area, or perhaps slightly closer to Notting Hill. And that's based on where the bodies were found, where they were picked up, and other data. Um, I mean, for people who don't know anything about geographic profiling, a really basic, simple analogy would be something like a, a, a lawn sprinkler. So it throws water around. You never know where the drops are going to land, but you know roughly where the center of the sprinkler is. That is the theory. Now, all the crimes are different. You have burglars who will do, commit crimes in a certain way. Murderers will quit, commit crimes, but often the killer lives in the middle somewhere. They, they nearly always want to work in an area that they know. This is the same with burglars and, and serial rapists. So the geographic profiler is able to look at lots of different factors depending on what the crime is. So they'll look at things like routes, where bus stops are, where bodies were found, where they were deposited, how many people are around, and they will then put that into the computer. So there's a combination of the algorithm and the skill of the profiler and that's how they come up with this. So had the police had that in the 60s, they could have looked at Hammersmith a lot more closely. And had they done so, they would have come up, they would have possibly and very likely found somebody there who would have been a very good suspect. And that person 
is Harold Jones, who lives slap bang in the middle of the hotspot. Now, Harold Jones is a man who, as a young man, as a 15-year-old, was imprisoned for, the, for two child murders uh, uh, and attempted and rapes. He, he came from a place in Wales called um, Abertillery. And as a young man, he inveigled two young girls uh, to, to go with him and attempted to all rape both of them and then killed them in the most horrific way. Now, because he was just before his 16th birthday, he pled guilty to avoid being tried as a 16-year-old, in which case he would have been an adult and could have been hanged. So he was, went to jail, I think it was 1921. Now, this story is quite interesting, and if you bear with me for a second, I'll give you a brief outline of why he would have been the strongest suspect in this case. He was in jail all through the 1920s and 30s, and he had various psych psychiatric uh, assessments while he was in jail. Now, interestingly, he told psych psychiatrists that he had this desire to murder, and he did not want to be cured of it. I mean, he sounds like a textbook psychopath. But what happened by the time the Second World War came along was that there'd been a change of regime at the top and the prison had a new governor who took a much more charitable view to Harold Jones and said, actually, I think he, he could be a fit member of society. If we release him into the armed forces, he'll do his duty and could, quote, one day be the father of happy children. And so Harold Jones was given a, a new name and was put into the armed forces and emerged into London after the war with nobody knowing that he'd been in jail as a child killer or what he'd done. Or he, he was able to pass himself off as an ex-serviceman and he married the daughter of a policeman and lived in West London. He ends up living in... Um, Hammersmith and his daughter, who is still alive, never knew that he'd been in jail for a double child murder. Now, the interesting thing about him is that um, he lived in a street in Hammersmith, which was literally two streets away from two other victims. So he was, I mean, probably within a minute and a half's walk to where Bridget O'Hara lived. Now, she was last seen in a pub on Shepherd's Bush Green. Now, they both lived very close to the pub. It, it, whatever other elements there are to this case, the fact that he lives so close to two victims is an extraordinary coincidence. I mean, literally two streets away. If you look it up on a map, you'll, you'll see how close he was. Now, there are other aspects to him as well. He changed his name several times while living in West London, which suggests that he was not living... Uh, a law-abiding life. I mean, why would anyone change their name several times over? He, you know, he admitted that he did not want to be cured of his uh, desire to kill. He killed two children, and the victims, again, to come back to the fact they were all very small, suggests that he may have had a, a bit of a pattern going on there, and he also had something of an oral fixation, which, again, sort of ties in with the fact that the teeth were removed from the victims, and when there is testimony from a girlfriend of his when he was 15 to say that he'd asked her he'd asked her to spit in his mouth so he has this kind of strange oral thing going on he's living there he's living a kind of secretive life even though he's married and he's very close to the victims now he doesn't feature anywhere in any of the police reports but it seems incredible that had they not had they known um, that he was there they would have been all over him because he was way ahead of anyone else that they ever had in the frame for the, for the crimes. How does he pop up to you in your research on this? There's no conclusive evidence against him, but circumstantially, he's a fantastic fit. He, he worked on the trading estate where the bodies were kept. The bodies, um, the police eventually were able to work out that the dust and paint particles on the bodies, they traced that to close to where Bridie O'Hara was bodies was, was found on the uh, Heron trading estate where there'd been, a, an, uh, I think it was an aeroplane spray painting shop and, um, or factory, and they'd been kept there, which it was derelict. So the killer had been storing the bodies. Now, he worked on the estate. Um, there's a couple of questions about, if we knew the answers to them, it would 
push him very, very far out as a as very enticing uh, possibility. Did he have a driving license? We, uh, I, we have not been able to find that out. Um, and did he have access to a grey van? Because on two occasions, a grey van was seen uh, in very suspicious circumstances. Um, now, it could be that from his job on the trading estate, he did have access to a van. Um, he'd, he'd been in the army, he'd been an engineer. Um, he probably, he, it's very possible he was a driver. So those two aspects would really push him very strongly to the forefront of this case. Um, and I think by and large, he's easily the strongest uh, possibility. But as I say, there's, there's nothing which pins him down absolutely. So he's certainly better than anything that Scotland Yard came up with at the time. Um, and that's largely because today we're able to look at the geographic profile and, and cross-reference that with where he was living and see that actually he was right in the middle of this crime area. Whenever, uh, whenever you were researching this, when did you first see him pop up? I, I've met, mentioned him in the book, but because he was never mentioned in the, in the police reports, I didn't write him up too big. But subsequently, um, the BBC made a documentary, which I featured on, and I was able to talk to David, Professor David Wilson, who's one of Britain's leading um, criminologists. Uh, and we talked about it quite a lot. And the, the, the theory of the documentary they pushed it very hard that it, he was the strongest suspect. And I, I agree with that. I, don't, I, I wouldn't go quite as far as the program and, and trying to pin it on him because I just don't think we can be certain. But if the police ever had um, a reason to reopen the case today, they would be able to look at the, the um, driving records, which are not open to the public. They would then be able to see if he had a driving license, if he owned a van or or... They could also look at his employment records to find out what, I mean, one of the other interesting questions about him, of course, is what did he do between leaving the army and the 1960s? We, we don't have a great deal of idea what his movements were then. We know his addresses, he lived between Fulham and Hammersmith, which is all West London, but what was he doing? Um, so there are questions about him, um, but yeah, he's easily the strongest, you know, he was a psychopath quite clearly. and. People are not cured of that, you know, that doesn't go away. Um, it was a terrible blunder, really, letting, letting him out, even if he was going to serve in the armed forces. I mean, he was always going to remain a danger. And particularly the fact they gave him this kind of cover. He came out and nobody, you know, he'd come out as a, as a serviceman and it was easy for him to then set himself up as a, as a normal bloke living in London and working. Somewhat unrelated, but now I'm really curious. Do we know what he did in the military, like what his role was? I, I think he was a sapper and he was, he was uh, one of his jobs, I think was in, in testing tanks and, but he was stationed abroad. So he was working, I think they'd bring out new things and he'd be working on them to sort of, and he had a good record as a soldier. Um, he, he'd, um, you know, he, he served without any blemishes um, and he came out, you know, and was able to start a family. With, and also if you, you know, one of the things which is interesting about him is, he married the daughter of a policeman. Now, for a, for a cunning, uh, entitled psychopath, that must have been quite a thrill to woo the daughter of a police officer and then marry her without anyone knowing that he'd actually been a child murderer. It's just, it is very creepy. <laughs> And on top of that, when you think about that in that context of, you know, being technically now he's related by marriage to a police officer, you can almost imagine if he is the killer, him casually having conversations with his father-in-law about the murders. You know, what can you tell me about that? You know, kind of like uh, he's wanting to hear his father-in-law talk about it because, you know, to him, well, he doesn't know, but, you know, it's me. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I mean, talking like Edmund Kemper used to do similar things yeah, when he would yeah. go to that police bar, you know? Yeah. And so it's, oh, damn, how typical. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, that's right. Um, I think his father-in-law was retired by that stage, but yeah, he would have still got a buzz out of that kind of, it's me, but you don't know it. Yeah, he's a, he's a chilling character. And one of the things he said at the time when he was 15, um, 
he'd been, I think he'd been tried twice and he got off the first time as a 15 year old. And he'd said something like, I outsmarted those men from Scotland Yard because Scotland Yard had sent detectives from London all the way out to Wales to investigate him. They rather foolishly tried him before they really had conclusive evidence and he got off and he was kind of really cocky about it. Um, but then he committed another murder and they got him the second time. So, and that's as a 15 year old. So um, he was a fairly, you know, fairly uh, sadistic, nasty character. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today at Crime Country as we explored a fascinating and terrifying subject that has long since been forgotten by the general public, and that is none other than the 1960s Ripper. And so, comment your thoughts below, but more importantly, check out the links in the video description where it will take you to all of the awesome work that our wonderful guest is doing to where you can also explore his writings and really take advantage of all the awesome insights that he has to offer. Robin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Nick. It's been, it's been interesting. <laughs>